Hallelujah. Welcome to this evening service. We're going to have on the 3rd of, of October and God's own country, the city of Palagat. It's such a joy. We uh, had a tremendous week this, this day, a week, past week. We went to, to a few places and we really enjoyed ourselves. I'm going to start the evening with a Psalm, Psalm 87. Uh, it says, His foundation is in the holy mountains. The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. Glorious things are spoken of you, O city of God, Selah. I will make mention of Rehab, Babylon, to those who know me. Behold, O Felicia and Tyre with Ethiopia, the, this one was, was born there. And of Zion it will be said, this one and that one were born in her. And the Most High himself shall establish her. The Lord will record when he registers the people, the one who was born there, Selah. Both the singers and the players and the instruments say, all my springs are in you. This is a beautiful psalm. It actually taught me how important Jerusalem is. Uh, the verse 1 says, His foundation is in the holy mountains. Yahweh is not a local deity. The whole, earth, the whole earth belongs to him. But yet, he had a special regard for Jerusalem, which he described as the holy mountains. Now, count his foundation when he says God's foundation is in Jerusalem, the center of his redemptive work, which he established was, was in, in Jerusalem. It had to happen somewhere, but God chose Jerusalem, and that's why this place is so important. Why is it so important? I'll tell you a few things which which is why Jerusalem is such an important place. Melchizedek, the king and the priest of the God, the Most High, he reigned there. Abraham was willing to sacrifice his son Isaac. And that's a place in Jerusalem. David, the king, Israel's greatest king, the earthly king, reigned and made the kingdom his capital in Jerusalem. The tabernacle of God, which was built by Solomon, and it was designed by, by uh, uh, David, that was done in Jerusalem. The various institutions of sacrifice and worship and priestly service were all conducted, were all established over the centuries at, at Jerusalem. There, Jesus recognized and honored the city and he observed the feast and the various rituals in the temple. There Jesus died for our sins and he was buried and rose from the dead. Another one, the church was born in the day of the Pentecost at Jerusalem. The apostles, all the apostles served and were out, sent out to preach the gospel to the far corners of the world, they left from Jerusalem. God is, will establish the physical and the geographic center of his ultimate kingdom upon in this earth in that place. The Lord loves the gates, verse 2 says, the Lord loves the gates of Zion. For all the reasons and more reasons than which I actually have told you now, God has a special love for Jerusalem. And in regarding it more, it is more than anything else, it is a special holy land. Verse 3 says, Glorious things are spoken of you, O city of God. The psalmist prays, prays Jerusalem. And if nothing else about the city, it is the the most fantastic city because of all the reasons I just told you. Glorious things have happened there. Glorious faith was exercised in Jerusalem. 
glorious things happened in Jerusalem. Things were taught in Jerusalem. Worship was offered in Jerusalem. A glorious atonement was made in Jerusalem. Glorious anointing was poured out in Jerusalem. A lot of things happened in Jerusalem. And a glorious future awaits Jerusalem. Verse 6 says, O Zion, it will be said, this one were born in her. The psalmist repeated the thought of the earlier verse. The identification with Zion, the city of God, will be so wonderful and precious that it will be, it'll be great to say for you and me, it will be great to say that this one was born there. That you and me were born in, in Zion. In Jesus Christ, every believer can have the privilege of registration in Zion. You and me can register ourselves as being born in Zion. We have that privilege because we are born in Christ. Or being a citizen, citizen of that heavenly place of God. This is not the ultimate thing, it's special. There are various other things which are good as well. The blessedness of of Zion's citizen. It, it's in verse 7. Both the singers and the prayers on the instrument say, All my springs are you, are in you. The springs refer to the spontaneous flowing of water, sources of water, and life as a refreshment as it comes into a dry place, into a dry land. And in all our supplications, it is better to see that the reference to God and that all my springs are in you. It always means God, our springs are always in God. With all these references, every good and perfect gift comes from God. It comes from God alone. So all we are, or all we hope to be, all we have or attain, ever attain, it all comes from God alone. We, only, we can hope and attain everything from God. The people of God acknowledge this and they praise God for that, that he will ultimately give them all these things and he alone receives the glory, honor and praise from us. Come, let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for this day, Father. We pray that, Lord, that you will be present with us this evening, that your spirit will be among us. And I pray, Father, that this evening, as we worship you, I pray that, Lord, that you will bless the worship team, Father, that you'll give us a new song in their mouth. And as they're saying, I pray, Father, that it will be accepted in your throne room, Father. I pray for the word, Father, I pray there will be unction in the pulpit. And I pray every word which Suji speaks will come forth with power and under the unction of the Holy Spirit. And I pray, Father, lives will be transformed, lives will be changed listening to the word of God this evening. So I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, that whatever we do this evening, that you will receive the glory and honor because all of it belongs to you and you alone. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's have uh, the worship team come and, and uh, sing the worship songs to us and praise to God.
and all that you are going to do for us, Lord. We say thank you. We say thank you. We say thank you, and we lift you on high, Lord. For you are our gracious heavenly Father who loves us so much, Lord. Your love for us is great, Lord Jesus, and we are rescued by your great love, Lord. So we come to adore you, to admire you, to give you the highest praise, because it all belongs to you. Come, be thou enthroned on the praises of your people. Be thou lifted on high. We are here to lift you higher and higher.
praise you. Thank you for coming, Lord. Thank you for blessing your people, Lord. Yes, Lord, we fix our eyes on you. We fix our eyes on you to gaze upon your beauty, Lord Jesus, to be transformed, Lord, in your presence, Lord. We gaze into your flaming eyes of fire, Lord. Come and transform us with your spirit. Come and transform us with your fire, Father. Come touch every heart. Come touch your people, Lord. We need your spirit.
we are in your presence. Refresh your people with the power of your Holy Ghost. Revive each and every heart. Revive each and every spirit, Lord. Turn the lives around, Lord, for your glory and honor, Lord. Jesus, we look to you.
strength, Lord Jesus, and the comfort of your children, Lord. Yes, we entirely depend on you, Lord, for we draw our strength from you. We draw our nourishment from you, Lord Jesus. So we come to you, Lord, for you have the power, Lord, to resurrect things in our life. Lord, you are able to cause us to rise above the situations, above the circumstances. Lord, you are the one, through you, we can rise above the storm and soar high. Father, thank you, Lord Jesus, for always being with your people, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for coming. I searched the world. Yeah.
get off the mountain to get off the valley there's not a place mercy and grace won't find me split open the Red Sea, Lord Jesus. You made a highway for your people, for your children, Lord, to walk out of the wilderness, Lord Jesus. You are a wonder-working God. You are a powerful God, Lord Jesus. At the mention of your name, everything changes, and there is always a way in you, Lord Jesus. Though we may not see it, Lord, but there is always a way for your people, Lord, to walk upon. Yes, Lord Jesus, you are the one who satisfied your people with the water, O oh Father, Lord Jesus. In the deserted place, Lord, you gave them water to drink, O oh Lord, out of the rock, Lord. Jesus, your power, your power, Lord Jesus is lord amazing and wonder working lord we believe in you and we give our lives to you lord jesus you can cause the lame to walk the blind to see the deaf to hear the mute to speak lord and there is power in your name and there is freedom in your name lord jesus so we worship you we bow down to the king of kings and the lord of lords who is almighty who is all powerful lord jesus and we serve a mighty living one. Our God is living and very much alive in our midst. And he's alive in us. He's alive in his bride. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your power that's working in our midst, that works in us, around us, above us. Thank you, Jesus. We depend on you. We depend on you, Lord. Jesus, thank you, Lord, for coming and blessing your people, Lord. Thank you for refreshing us and reviving us, O oh Lord. Speak to us, Lord Jesus. We want to feed on your manna from heaven, O oh Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord, for we are thirsty for more of you. We are hungry for more of you, Lord Jesus. Here we are, Lord. Feed us, Lord, in your presence so we can be revived, Lord Jesus, and refreshed and draw strength from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good evening, a very warm welcome to everyone who is watching. I know that you would have enjoyed the worship just as I did, to know that our God is alive, that our God is a God of impossible things. He can make a way where there seems no way. For those of you who feel your ways have been blocked, for those of you who feel you live in confined spaces where you have been kept prisoners for years, for those of you who feel that you need to get out of that narrow place, that hard place, that difficult place, there's one way and that one way is to call upon the name of Jesus. Because the Bible tells us that all those who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus shall be saved. This evening I've titled my message Prevailing Prayer. I know that there have been many messages preached on prayer. Yet I believe that we all need a reminder to make sure that our relationship with God is strong that we stand plugged in connected because that is our lifeline 
And should that snap, then we are depriving ourselves from having the power of heaven working in our lives. I'm always excited to preach and teach about prayer because I know that the possibilities of prayer and is unimaginable. Because you can be here seated on earth, maybe in your bedrooms, maybe in your office, maybe on a bus traveling to work, but you can connect with heaven and move things by unleashing the power of God in your lives. And that can only be done through the channel of prayer. And this evening, I, I'm going to remind you of three people in the Bible who, who prayed and received answers. But that is not my whole message. My message is to show you also why we need to pray and what are those things that keep us from praying and how we need to make certain adjustments in our life. Because I know that Every time you have stepped into a church, I'm sure the pastor would have encouraged you, telling you that you need to pray. People around you, when you're in a difficult situation, would tell you, pray. But yet, the sad thing is that very often we don't do what is actually the easiest thing and the most useful thing. This evening, I'm going to be first talking to you about a man called Jabez. There's a mention of him, just two verses in the book of 1 Chronicles, chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. There are two verses about him. And in this chapter of Chronicles, the chapter before that and the chapter after that, is all about genealogies, who begot whom, and after that, who else came in the line, and so on, about family trees. But in the middle of it, the Bible talks about this man, because this man has found, or rather has been noticed by God. So I'm going to be reading to you from verses 9 and 10 of First Chronicles chapter 4. It says, Now Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. And his mother called his name Jabez, saying, Because I bore him in pain. And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory, that your hand would be with me and that you would keep me from evil, that I may not cause pain. So God granted him what he requested. These two verses speak a lot, a lot of things. God, the Holy Spirit here tells us that Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. Honorable because he was a man who called upon the name of the God of Israel. He was in a tight spot, a difficult spot. His mother had named him pain. And every, every time somebody called his name out, he was reminded about how he had brought pain to his mother and he must have been desperate for a name change or desperate for a new identity. 
Very difficult to, to have a name like pain. And Jabez, being in that situation, knew that the only person who could ever help him was God. And verse 10 here tells us, Jabez called on the, on the God of Israel. He went straight and hit the bullseye. He did not go around like many of us when we are in trouble, go around. And maybe the last thing we do is pray. We try everything, different doors, everything in the book, hoping that we can somehow help ourselves. But Jabez knew exactly where to go. And he called on the name of the God of Israel. And there were four things that he asked for. He said, God, enlarge my territory, meaning in, increase my influence. I'm in a small little place. I'm hemmed in. God, increase my territory, increase my influence. He said, Lord, not just that, I also want you to be with me. He says, Lord, that your hand will be with me. He asked for a blessing, but he also wanted the blesser. He said, God, let your hand be with me. Be with me, Lord. Because when you are with me, I know that I will lack for nothing. Jabez knew his God. I wonder how many of us know our God. I wonder how many of us know exactly where to go. I wonder how many of us live in small situations, difficult situations, in narrow places, because we have not called upon the name of God, neither trusted him, nor looked to him for help. And then he says, keep me from evil, Lord. Because he did not want to sin against his God. He did not want to do evil. Because he knew the heart of God. He knew how much God hates evil. So he says, Lord, keep me from evil. And then he says, God, I don't want to cause anyone pain. I don't want to cause anyone pain, Lord. I want to be a blessing to people. I don't want to cause anyone pain. And this account ends with this sentence, it says, so God granted him what he requested. That so in the Bible says that God answered him because he called upon his name in faith and he knew that that was the only place where help would come and his wholehearted devotion and love and hope in God made God answer his request. Here we see my first example of prayer is Jabez who was a man who was honored by God. Honored because he knew exactly where to go in his time of need. There is one thing that we can learn from Jabez. And the one thing is that when we are in trouble, let's make a beeline to God. Because that is a place of refuge and that is a place where we'll get sure help and answers. The second person I'm going to be talking about today is Abraham. We all know that Abraham was called the friend of God. Friend of God because Abraham walked with God. There are many times we sing songs, I am a friend of God, I am a friend of God. But what you're singing, I wonder, is that really true? Are we really friends of God? Because being a friend if someone calls someone a friend, it means that the, uh, the two people are close, 
two people have a good relationship, the pe two people know each other well, very often when we sing that song, we need to really ask ourselves, are we really, really friends of God? Do we really have, because two, two friends normally, there's a saying that birds of a feather flock together. If you are a friend of God, you need to walk with God and think the thoughts of God and know the heart of God. And Abraham was called the friend of God and God called him his friend. And we have an, instant, an incident in the life of Abraham where God comes down and meets with Abraham and tells him about the wonderful things that he's going to be doing for him. And also, this, this account is from Genesis chapter, 60, chapter 18. It's from 16 to 33. I'm not going to be reading right through, but I'm just going to be highlighting a few verses in this. I'm going to be starting from, I'm going to be reading verse 16 that says, Then the men rose from there, that is God and the angels, and looked towards Sodom. And Abraham went with them to send them on the way. And verse 17. And the Lord said, that is, the Lord had come with two of the angels. And he says, and the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm doing? Now, because Abraham was God's friend, God said that, I don't think I can hide. Because he was planning to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because of the terrible sins of that place. But then he says, how can I hide this thing from my friend Abraham? Because normally, friends don't hide things from each other. If you're a good friend, close friend, you would definitely share things that, 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 are, that are important to you. And here God says, I, I cannot hide this from Abraham. And then he tells Abraham that I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And at that point of time, Verse 18 says, since Abraham, uh, he says, sorry, I'm going to be reading from 19. It says, for I have known him in order that he, might, that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he had spoken to him. He says, Abraham is going to be a great nation. I'm going to, he's going to follow after me. His children are going to be blessed. A great nation is going to come out of him. So I need to keep him in the loop. And verse 20, the Lord says, And the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is grave, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it. That has come to me, and if not, I will know. So God is going to go and check and walk around, and he's going, planning to go and destroy them. At that point of time, you need, we, we know that Abraham's nephew Lot lived in Sodom and Gomorrah. And now Abraham was concerned when God said, I'm going to destroy the entire place there. And Abraham goes up to God. In verse 23, he says, And Abraham came near and said, Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there were 50 righteous within the city. Would you also destroy the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous that were in it? So here there's an account right through from, from verse 22 right up to 33. The account goes on where Abraham goes and says, he keeps talking to God, dialoguing with God and saying, God, if there are 50 people, would you destroy Sodom? And then the Lord says, okay, I will let them go if there are 50 righteous people. Then he says, Lord... What if there are 45? Then he says, what if there are 40 people? The Lord says, okay, then I'll spare the city. 
And he goes back and says, what if there are 35 people? Because all the time his heart is aching for his nephew there. And there he keeps on. He says, Lord, what if there are 35? What if there are 30 people? What if there are 25 people? What if there are 20 people? Each time he says, Lord, would you destroy it? Would you not spare it for the sake of those righteous 20? And then he goes on negotiating and dialoguing and pleading on behalf of the city because of his nephew. And finally, it comes down to 10. He says, if there are 10 righteous people, Lord, would you not spare the city? The Lord says, if there are 10, I will spare the city. But then the account goes on that there are not even 10 righteous people. And God destroys Sodom and Gomorrah. But before that, he sends his angel to rescue Lot and his wife and, and his two daughters. They literally run out of, the, of Sodom, the city there, Sodom and Gomorrah. And when God is raining down fire and brimstone and upon them, I, but the angel of the Lord had warned Lot's wife, don't turn back and look. But unfortunately, she turns back and looks and she becomes a pillar of salt. From this account, we realize that God is someone who is, he binds himself in, when he knows that we pray and we ask him for mercy. There are times that he even changes his mind. So great are the possibilities of prayer when we plead with God, when we ask God for certain things in our lives. Though, they were, though God was going to destroy the city, he knew Abraham's heart. And he did save his nephew and his family. I want to go to the, the third example of prayer. I'm just going running through these three examples quickly because I, I've got a lot more things to cover. The third one is about the story of Jacob. It's, the account is in the book of Genesis, chapter 32, verses 22 to 30. Here is Jacob fleeing. He's already left Laban, that is his uh, uncle and also his father-in-law he's taken his wives and his children and all that belongs to him and is coming back again to Canaan coming back to the land of his father but he's very afraid of his brother Esau and he's wondering whether Esau will come and kill him and destroy his family and that night I'm going to be reading from verse 22 he says that night we have Jacob he arose that night and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven sons, and crossed over the ford of Jabbok. He took them, sent them over the brook, and sent over what he had, all the livestock that he had. He sent it all across the brook. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the break of day. Here, the so-called man, if you see in the book, in your Bible, in, your, in the Word of God, the man is in capital letters. And this is believed to be God who came and wrestled that night with Jacob until the breaking of day. And when he saw that he did not prevail against him, so that the wrestling was going on, and Jacob was also wrestling all night. He touched the socket of his hip. And the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Now Jacob knew that, that this was, he believed maybe an angel of God or God himself who had come and was wrestling with him. And he said, I'm not going to let you go. He held on that tight. And all night he went on. He did not let go. And he says, I will not let you go until you bless me. So 
So he said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Here in this account, we, we have Jacob who is desperate for a blessing. He's not ready to let go of God. Because he had money, he was wealthy, he was a wealthy man. He had livestock, he had everything, because in those days, uh, man's wealth was, uh, was measured by the amount of livestock he had and the gold and silver he had. So he was a wealthy man, Jacob. But Jacob knew that just mere wealth could not take him very far. He knew that he needed to have the favor of God in his life. And therefore, he says, God, I will not let you go unless you bless me. I need your favor. I need your protection. I need, you, need your presence to go before me. I need you to safeguard me. Because I don't know what's going to happen to my life with my brother after me. And God says, what is your name? And Jacob here, actually Jacob means um, trickster, supplanter, somebody who will circumvent things to grab what he wants. And that's how Jacob was all his life. Stole a blessing from his brother, uh, uh, tricked his, uh, his uncle. Did so many things. But here, that's the reason God says, I want to give you a new identity. No more are you going to be a supplanter and a trickster. You are going to be Israel. Somebody who has power, favor with God, and favor with man. We have like this n number of examples of people who were desperate, desperate for God to come through and change their situations. Unfortunately, we don't have many people who are desperate enough, or even if they're desperate, who know how to receive a blessing from God, how to receive things from God, how to move out of their difficult situations. Not many people know how to wrestle all night in prayer. Not many people know how to negotiate and dialogue with God and, and receive things from God. Many times people just let go of situations and allow circumstances and situations to just come and, and take over their lives. They don't have God and his lordship and his plans for their lives. They are lackadaisical, laid back, and drift through life. And we know that life is very short and it's over very quickly. And before you know what it is, it's your time to go. And very often you are in situations and circumstances that God never really planned you to be in. Because God's plans for us are wonderful. It says... I, no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor the heart of man has even imagined or perceived what God has for them that wait on him, who know him, who, who pray, who know how to wrestle, who know how to intercede, who know how to cry out to God for a blessing. God's greatest sorrow is, that, is when men do not pray. I'm going to be reading from Isaiah chapter 62, verses 6 and 7. It says, I have set watchmen on your walls of Jerusalem. They shall never hold their peace day or night. You who make mention of the Lord, do not keep silent. He says, do not keep silent. And give him no rest till he establishes. Until he makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. It says, don't give yourself rest. Don't give me rest. That's what God is saying in this passage. Until I make you a praise in the earth. Un until you become someone distinguished. 
until God has enlarged your territory, until you stand up, stand in a place that God has planned for you. Until you stand on the heights of the land. That's, the, that's his plan for his people. Because he wants you to be the salt and the light. And a light cannot be hidden. Your life cannot be hidden if it's harnessed to God's power and his greatness. That's why he says, don't give me rest. Don't give yourselves rest. Cry out to me that I would establish you. Ezekiel 22, 30, it says, I sought for a man among them who would stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it, but I found no one. He says, here it's literally saying, I'm looking for people who will stand between me and people in trouble, people who are perishing, people who are, who are in hardship. How often do we stand in the gap? Do we pray for someone else and cry out for someone else or cry out for the body of Christ or cry out for our country or cry out for our children? Many of us lose our children to misfortune because we have not stood in the gap. Many of us, are, are, our lives are in turmoil, in utter confusion, because we have not stood in the gap for our families. Here it's literally like God is saying, I'm looking for someone who will stand, but I find no one. There are very, 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 very few people who have actually signed up to stand before God for themselves, for their families, for their children, and for others. Prayer is something that opens out the very door of heaven to you. Very often, we find so many shortcut methods to get what we want. But we do not pray. In the book of James chapter 2, it says you lust and you do not have. Many times you're wanting things. You're desperate for things. Oh, I want this. Oh, I wish I had that. You're wanting. You lust, but you do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. So even if you're some, there are people who are ready to kill, but they still don't get what they want. You fight and you war. There are times when we fight for things. Fights over property, fights over this, fights over that. This belongs to me, this is mine. And it says, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You do not have because you do not ask. You're ready to do everything else. Fight for stuff, take shortcut methods and achieve your goals and, you, and yet you do not have it. If, if only you had prayed. That's what James, the book of James tells us. If only you have asked, you would have had. There are many times you know, I've gone sometimes to, uh, like, you know, to places, maybe even secular places. And I've seen this wonderful verse of Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 to 8, written there. Sometimes even in, in places of different uh, faiths, I've seen this verse because many have, many have taken this wonderful verse from the Bible and put it up there on their walls. It says, ask and it and will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks, receives, and he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. A very simple verse. Everybody, many people know it by heart. Many Christians know it by heart. But yet they do not put it into practice. It says ask. Keep on asking. You will receive. Don't give up in the middle of it just because you didn't get it. Because you're not persistent enough. And you're not ready to stand there. 
and, and get what is yours. It says, seek. What if you lost something? If you lost your wallet, would you just be sitting and say, oh, I lost my wallet and just sit tight? No, you would turn everything upside down and search for that wallet till you found it. The same way we need to seek after God with all our heart till we find him. And, the, and he says, knock, keep on knocking, keep on asking, keep on seeking. Because for whoever asks, they will get it. Jesus is the very words of Jesus in the parable. In, uh, it's, the account is in Luke uh, chapter 18 verses 1 to 8. I'll quickly read through it. It says, Then he spoke a parable to them. Parable, like I told you, is, is, a, is, a, is, is like a small little uh, story that tells us um, and gives us a hidden meaning of something else. It says, Then he spoke a parable to them. And me, that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. That's what God wanted us to know. So he, he, he told us this little story. He told the disciples this little story and those who were standing around him this story. There was a certain city, a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Now there was a widow in that city and she came to him saying, get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterwards he said within himself, though I do not fear God nor regard man, Yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest, lest by her continual coming she, coming she, weary, she weary me. Then the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry day and night to him, though he bears long with them, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? The story about this, this judge who was unjust. And he had no mercy. Yet he was ready to do what this widow asked because she kept coming back over and over and over and over again. Persistently saying, please make sure that I get justice. Make sure I get justice. And this Judge finally does everything he can to give him justice because give her justice because he says, oh gosh, if I don't do that, she's going to just tire me out with her coming. And here the Lord says, when an unjust judge could do this, shall not a good God, a loving God avenge his people? Will he not give them justice? And yet he says, will I find faith on the earth? In other words, saying, not many are going to pray. Not many will pray because they don't have to pray. You need faith. And very often, we people don't pray because they don't believe. They have no faith. They don't have faith that their prayers are going to be answered. They don't have faith and they don't believe that God is a God of love and mercy who loves you so much that there's nothing that he will not do for you. That is the reason that that particular passage ends with that question. But when the Son of Man comes, when God finally comes on the earth, will he ever find faith? Will there be people who are praying? Because we need, if we have no faith, we will not pray. James 5, 17 to 18 tells us. The book of James, chapter 5, verses 17 to 18. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Now all the people that we talked about, it's not that they were like, you know, holier than you and I. Today we stand under a better covenant. We stand under the blood of Jesus. We have the blood of Jesus for us. We stand righteous under the new covenant. And Elijah was of the old covenant. Yet, the account goes on, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. 
an ordinary man like you and I, you and me. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again. And the heaven gave rain and the earth produced its fruit. Amazing. A man like you and me, all he did was he prayed. And God heard his prayer and shut the heavens for three and a half years. And then he prayed and God opened the heavens. Why do you think that the Bible is replete with these kind of examples? These, the people in the Bible are just like you and me. And yet, they have got amazing answers from God. Signs and wonders and miracles. Because they chose to pray. They prayed because they had faith in God and they believed that there was a God who would hear, who would answer, who would deliver them from their distress, who would give them everything that they needed at that particular point of time, that he would meet them at the point of their need, their wants and their desires, that he would not overlook them, that God would never overlook a prayer. They knew that. But how many of us today pray? We don't pray because we're not actually not really expecting God to answer. Hebrews 11.6 tells us, But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe He exists. First of all, any man beginning to pray first should believe that there is a God and that God exists. And he should also believe that He is a rewarder of all who diligently seek Him. We need to believe in the existence of God. We need to know that God is a God who hears, who answers, and he will 101%, 100% definitely reward every person who seeks after him diligently, diligently, persistently, with faith. And there is no way that God will not answer us. But God also gives us certain uh, guidelines for prayer. Matthew 6, 7 says, And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do. For they think that they will, be he they will be heard for their many words. Vain repetitions. Don't just use just useless words like, like what, uh, what God is saying here is. Don't just come with some words that you just keep praying and mumbling every day the same thing over and over again. It doesn't talk about persistence here. You need to be persistent. But when he talks about vain repetitions, he's talking about many times that we just keep just praying the same things over and over again, just more, just like something that we need to say and get it over and done with. Like very often, before we go to sleep, we just mumble, Oh God, thank you for today, thank you this, thank you for that, thank you for that, amen. And we just flop into bed. Our minds are not even there. That is what God is talking about when he says vain repetitions. He wants us to engage with him emotionally, physically, spiritually, in every way, mentally. We, he wants us to be engaged. That's the reason many times if you see... In the, in the Bible, people fell on their faces and they prayed. Jesus himself, in the Garden of Gethsemane, fell on his face. We need to engage physically. People lifted up their hands and prayed. People wept loudly and prayed. They poured out their hearts before God. They engaged emotionally with deep, deep cries. Jesus cried deeply. He prayed so strongly that he sweated out blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. If you read in the book of Ezra, you see Ezra weeping and crying and plucking out his beard. That must have been really painful to pluck out somebody's beard because they were, he was so distraught that the people of Israel had turned their back upon their God. He was moved and cut in his heart. And he wept. But we, our prayers are so 
sometimes just empty words with no emotion with nothing and that is what god says i do not want your your vain repetitions there are reasons also why people don't pray people don't pray because their hearts have grown cold cold towards god we have in the in the book of revelation it says the, the love of many will grow cold dead christians cannot pray because prayer many times people just want an inexpensive way of engaging with god they don't want the cost of discipline because prayer calls for discipline you need to discipline yourself you need to go get into the closet like what jesus said get into your closet shut the door pray in secret and your father who hears you and sees you in secret will answer you publicly publicly you will god be god will raise you up and bless you because what you do in secret that that those, those secret prayers will break out into your life as breakthroughs and god will honor you because you chose to honor him another thing another reason first reason is because people are indifferent to god they are not passionate about god they have no love they have no faith and their hearts have grown cold and they and they have no passion for god the second reason that people don't pray is because they are perverted priorities their priorities are all perverted they have a long list of things to do they need their jobs they run i'm not saying you shouldn't go for your job you need to go but i know people who rise up early in the morning at 4 o'clock so that they can pray before they can they can go out of the house but many people they have time for their jobs because they need the money they have time for their families they have time for children they have time for vacation they have time to go to the gym they have time to walk they have time to sleep they have time to eat cook their food they have time for everything but no time to sit and pray because god does not figure in their list of important things to do but if we really want god to show up in our lives then we really need to connect with him we need to give him first place in our lives like his like the very first commandment tells us love the lord thy god with all your heart with all your soul with all your mind with all your strength with all of you be passionate for god because when you are passionate for god then god comes through for you the third reason that people do not pray is because they have gotten used to living without prayer they they just manage without prayer they go to church maybe on a sunday and the rest of the week they do they, they do their own things land up in church again maybe they they feel okay i'm not doing any great sin i'm okay with god hi god i'm here you're there good god i'll see you on a sunday and that is their relationship with god because they've so gotten used to that just living through and sliding through life every day without engaging with god without being having that close connect with god and sometimes a whole year whole lifetime is lived like that and i wonder how do they think that they are going to live with god in eternity spend all every moment in eternity when they had absolutely no time for him here on earth that's the reason we have in the book of matthew 
that people will come and say lord lord i i i did this in your name lord i i fed the poor i did this and i did that and the lord says i don't know who you are get away from me you workers of iniquity because whatever we do our top priority needs to be our walk with god our quiet times with god our secret times with god every time people a, a, a nation like israel or judah had a godly king and they set the heart the bible says they set the heart to, to seek after god at those times there was rest and peace throughout the land the same way if you set your heart upon seeking the lord there will be rest and peace within your home within your borders there will be rest and peace because you are leaning on the arm of the lord and not on the arm of your own flesh because those who lean on the arm of flesh the bible tells us the arm of flesh will fail you but when we lean on the arm of god it will sustain us and the fourth reason that people do not pray is because they don't believe that god is really going to answer them they say oh this thing about prayer doesn't really really work for me there are times i've prayed i've fasted but god has not answered so they feel that there's, no, there's no reason to pray they feel okay let, let's just give up on this it's not really working for me why do you think that we need to pray is it only because we need to get things from the lord it's not just to receive things from the lord the most important reason that god instituted prayer was because god wanted he delights to have relationship with you you are important to him he delights to be with you it's his need he needs you he needs your love he needs he needs to talk to you that is the reason in the garden of eden in the cool of the evening he would come down and come and sit down and communicate and talk to it, to adam he's the same god who loves to have fellowship with you that's his greatest that's his need that's why the bible tells us god so loved the world so loved you and me that he wanted that he sent his son to die for you and me so that there's a there's a way open for you to come to come back to him and to come to him into the very presence of god into the very throne room of god calling out abba father that is a reason that he instituted prayer because he loves you he needs to hear you like a father every time my son sits at the table and his daughter is doing something else he says put that away at dinner time we need to talk we need to talk because he delights in her he wants to hear her talk and the same way god wants to hear you talk and the second reason that we pray is yes for relief yes because of our welfare but yes because we need god's help in our lives that's the second reason that we pray but that's not the foremost reason but most times our prayers are our lord i need a house lord i need a car lord i need a my bank balance is dwindling god i need to get a promotion oh god i need to get an increment i need i need some other second income oh lord i need this i need that but in the book of matthew the lord says do not like the heathen run after these things the father knows you need these things god knows that we need food on our table god knows that we need these things all our material needs is aware of 
He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his, and, my, and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. And he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. His righteousness is what? Your right standing with him. Your relationship with him. Set that right. Keep your attention fixed on that. Automatically, all these things will be added unto you. The Bible tells us Solomon in all his glory was not dressed like one of the lilies of the field. A, a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without the Lord knowing that it, that it fell to the ground. The numbers of a hair on your head are numbered. He says, do not run after these things. The heathens run after these things. The godless run after these things. For, uh, we need this, we need that, we need clothes, we need... Yes, our Heavenly Father knows that we need, need a house, we need clothes, we need a car. We, he'll give it to you, pressed down, shaken together, running over. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. His righteousness is your right standing with Him. Your right relationship with Him. Your right connection with Him. And all these things will be added unto you. I think this is a solemn call for all, for the, for the church, for the universal church, the ecclesia. It's time to pray. It's time to pray all kinds of different prayers. Prayers for our country, prayers for our, our home, prayers for our children. Prayers above all for God's plans and purposes in our life and God's purposes upon this world even in these last days God's plans and purposes and his power and his revival to be unleashed upon our world we need his light even as darkness covers the earth deep darkness the people but when the church cries out The light of God will come. The light and the salvation of God will come when the church starts praying. When you and I start praying, the light will come into the nation. The light will come into our economy. The light will come into our home. The light will come into every situation of our lives. When we pray, when you and I pray. So let's... Today will that we set our house in order that we set our lives in order and that we give God first place above all and that we go back into the closet that we set our heart upon this sacred union and communion with God so that life that his that our lives will please him and that we will delight him with our friendship and with our relationship with him because that's that is what his heart desires and everything else will fall into place for you and for me so let us be people who will give ourselves no rest and who will give god no rest until he establishes us God bless you and may God bless his word and may it bear much fruit in your lives. I invite the worship team and my granddaughter Haya to come and sing a song that is the prayer of Jeba, Jebus.
give the benediction and we will close. Lord, we just come before you, Father, this evening. We pray that the power that raised Jesus from the dead strengthen your inner beings for all good work. And may the blessings of Father, Almighty God, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you this day and forevermore. And all the saints of God said, Amen. Amen. See you next week, uh, same time, Saturday, 7 p.m. And have a wonderful week ahead. And uh, God bless you and, and uh, look forward to meeting you again next Saturday. Good night to everybody. Thank you.